I'm Professor George Wielden. I'm a geologist and I have been lucky enough to have come up to this particular part of the country since the early 1960s. My first trip into the Rubicon was with Mark Smith and Doc Bliss in 1962 and I've been coming ever since then frequently. I missed the last couple years. Um, I had a bout with kidney cancer last summer, couldn't make it, but that's all done and we're starting another cycle and, and going again. So if you see me with this, that's why I'm, you know, but I'm still going. <laughs> um, I came up to this part of the country and started teaching in the foothills in the early 60s. And at this particular part of the world, I came up here because of the skiing, the mountains, and everything else, and I've been lucky in the fact that I've lived here and enjoyed it all these years, and still am enjoying it. I was a geologist for the Forest Service for about seven years, and they actually paid me to come up here and bang on these rocks and look at this particular part of the country. So I have been all over here. I took a seismograph on a backpack and climbed up these ridges over here looking for uh, aggregate sources for the Forest Service. Uh, I've done avalanche studies in the high country up in here. Currently we're involved in doing some work on the recency of the earthquake activity and the potential volcanic activity in this particular part of the world. And when you see what's happened in this particular part of the country, it's just absolutely mind-boggling. It's here and the geology, what we're looking at, the geologist uses a whole bunch of little puzzles. He looks at rocks, he looks at minerals, he looks at fossils, he looks at these kinds of things as clues to what happened here. And what we do is the present is the key to the past. You're sitting on a rock that was glaciated about 10,000 years ago. The glacier came through this canyon was at least a mile thick. When it came over these rocks, it smeared and polished the surface of the rock. We know the glacier went in this direction. You can look up here and you can see the light reflecting off the smooth sp parts of the glacial polish. We tell the direction the glacier went. The ice was so heavy that it just created a tremendous pressure. It was like a conveyor belt. As it went downhill, it kind of chattered and jumped. And it picked up rocks along the way. And these rocks will leave grooves and striations on the surface here. You'll see this is a beautiful a crescent-shaped chatter mark here. It looks like a quarter moon. If you take that and consider that as a bow, put a string between the tips of the bow, put an arrow on it, pull the string back and let the string go and the arrow will shoot in the direction that the glacier flowed through this area here. So as we're sitting on this, these are the kinds of stories that the rocks tell us. So, you know, you, they're here, but what you have to do is just educate you and, and get you pointed in the right direction. You know, the rock we're sitting on is granite. Take me for granted. <laughs> you know, this is the, the corniest thing I tell my classes. Take me for granted. I'm not a basalt like in Hawaii, but this is really granite in this case in here. Sometimes you'll go along and you'll pick up these rocks, and I'm here for three days. If you pick up a rock that you don't know what it is, bring it over to me at lunch and say, what is this kind of a thing. A lot of these rocks are dirty and dusty from the trail. You really can't see what it looks like. Rinse it off in the water. If you're not close to water, you can actually lick the rock. <laughs> you know, that's something that you got to be careful. <laughs> Once you lick a rock, you're going to be infected for life and you're gonna be a rock hound. You're gonna be picking up rocks and licking them everywhere you go in that particular case. You know, at first you're not gonna let other people see you. You'll be kind of a, a closet licker in that particular case. But you know, once you do it a few times, boy, you're right out in the open in front of everybody. So take a look at these rocks and, and come up and talk to me and, and say, what is this? How did it form? These kinds of things. The history of the geology, I'm gonna cover about 300 million years of geology will get you up to the present of what's happening here. We now know with this new field of geology that the ocean plates 
then move because there's big spreading centers of magma coming up in the middle of the ocean basins. As new magma comes up, it pushes the ocean crust sideways, laterally. Pieces of an ancient continent about 300 million years ago off the northern coast of Australia were broken apart and rafted like a conveyor belt over across the Pacific and collided with North America. When they collided, these rocks tipped up on edge and went down into and were consumed in a subduction zone. So from Alaska to the tip of South America, we have what we call these accretionary zones. And this is just, you know, this happens in my class all the time. Class starts at 10 o'clock, you're five minutes late, so come on through, get a seat. And <laughs> yeah, no problem at all. <laughs> Rock from way back. Yeah, he's a he's a rock licker. You can tell he's got that look. So when these big chunks of the ocean plate tip up on edge, they are smashed and accreted against the edge of the continent. In the Sierras here, from the foothills down by Folsom all the way up to about where we are, there are seven major accretionary events, different ages of seafloor sediments and things like this. When these rocks are pushed up and smashed against the edge of the continent, the contact between each of these accretionary zones becomes a fault zone. This is a special environment geologically where the rock serpentine forms. When you find serpentine, as you drive up from Georgetown through, you'll see this green slick rock called serpentine. When you see that, that's a fault zone that marked the boundary of two of these accretionary plates. These fault zones, later on, as this accretionary plate went down and started to melt at a very great depth, 25 miles deep, that melting ultimately ended up slowly cooling, and this is the kind of result that we're talking about. The granite, or this granite batholith, we use the term batholith to describe a large mass of granitic rock over 40 square miles. So we're in the, Fort, we're in the Sierra Nevada batholith. This particular rock cooled 20 miles deep and then it slowly rose up and the top was eroded off to see this rock on the surface today. This rock didn't form on the surface, it formed that many miles deep. But when this rock was intruded in molten mass, there were hot fluids that came along with it. And these fluids came up the contact zones of these accretionary plates called fault zones. The major fault zone, the running right through the mother load runs 120 miles long from, Mar from Nevada City, North Downeyville, all the way to Mariposa. That's the main plumbing system for the mother load. All of the major gold mines located along the mother load occur on that particular fault zone. So that gives you an idea of what happened. That marked the accretionary plate boundary as we're looking at it. Later on at the end of the talk, we'll talk about the importance of gold and where it comes from and this type of stuff. And, you know, and is there any gold up in this area here? You go over the hill a little bit and there's a building down there that has these funny machines in it that you punch and the lights go blink, 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 and occasionally gold comes out into a tray. But you're not gonna find it here in the granite in this particular part of the world. But uh, right on the other side of Lake Tahoe, Virginia City, is the biggest silver strike on the west coast of North America, and it's starting again, and we'll talk about that. Now, when these rocks were accreted and pulled down, and this granite kind of came up here, the granitic rocks in the Sierras are older in the lower part of the foothills. They're about 200 million years old down there. The rock we're standing on right here is between 85 and 65 million. The youngest granitic rocks are the highest elevation wise in this particular area. So we've had these particular granitic rocks. The Sierras, the ancestral Sierras, weren't like they are today. These mountains are very, very young. The Sierra Nevada, where we're sitting right now, are less than three million years old. The Tahoe Basin is less than three million years old. Prior to that, we had kind of a mature landscape, and so there was some really spectacular things happening over in central Nevada. New studies indicate, and I'm working with a fellow out of Stanford, Paige Chamberlain and, and Chris Henry out of the University of Nevada in Reno, and we're talking about where did these volcanic rocks come from 
that are here sitting on top of the granite and on top of the Sierras. And what was the source of the volcanoes, volcanoes and how active were they? We have evidence of volcanic activity in California today. Where is the most recent volcano? Lassen. Lassen. Lassen erupted in 1917. How many of you are skiers? You get on the Mammoth? Long Valley. When you get off Charlie Four at that Mammoth, there's steam coming out of the side of the mountain in the middle of the winter from the edge of a magma chamber from a giant volcanic eruption. 760,000 years ago, Long Valley was formed in one big boom. And Mammoth is on the west side of that. It created a valley 13 miles east and west and about six miles north and south. It put volcanic ash into the state of Nebraska, up into Montana, covered Southern California with volcanic ash. You know, when St. Helens erupted, it put two inches of ash in Portland and shut the city down. My brother-in-law lives in Ventura. <laughs> in his backyard, he's got an eight-inch layer of ash running right through there. What would eight inches of ash do to I-5 through the middle or 405 down in LA today? That kind of activity is potentially possible. About 6,000 years ago, right on the Oregon border, there was a mountain called Mount Mazama. It blew up and put ash into Canada, into Montana, into Wyoming. We now know that as Crater Lake. That's only 7,000 years old. So it's very, very young. So if we talk about volcanic activity, there is a tremendous potential for that. The new studies indicate that about 40 million years ago, a large mass of igneous rock started to migrate in the upper part of the crust from up near the Canadian border. And it kind of worked its way piecemeal down through very deep in the Earth's crust, which is the top 10, 15 miles. And it started in Canada and ultimately ended up in central Nevada. In central Nevada, about 25 or 30 million years ago, this large mass of magma elevated central Nevada up. It, the studies, Chris Chamberlain at Stanford indicates that he has studies that indicate that central Nevada was from 15 to 17,000 feet elevation about 35 million years ago. This, we're sitting at eight to, uh, seven to 8,000 feet in here. So double this elevation in central Nevada. What happened was these giant magma intrusions then generated a series of massive volcanoes or created what we call a caldera. Crater Lake is a caldera. The volcanoes erupt and the thing collapses down into it. So we had super volcanoes erupting in central Nevada about 30 million years ago, creating giant calderas, these things that sink down in the edge. We know they're there, we've mapped them now and mapped the geology of them. In fact, it's interesting that there was a very large edge of a caldera in what is now called the Virginia City area. And the caldera in the Virginia City area, hot gases were coming up from the magma activity down below that and brought these solutions up that brought all of the mineral, the silver mineralization into Virginia City. So the caldera in the Virginia City area was mined 1860 and for about 60 years was mined pre-income tax. John Mackey made billions and never paid a dime tax in that particular area there. They're starting to mine the silver there again. So we can kind of explain where the minerals occur, the process in this particular case. A Paleo Valley, Paleo Valley, ancient valley, ran from the Virginia City area all the way through Virginia City over what is now the summit on the, way to, on, on the other side of Lake Tahoe, ran through what is now Lake Tahoe and came just north of here. And that Paleo Valley made a big turn in the Rubicon River and up near the Forest Hill Divide. About 30 million years ago, we had a huge canyon. This Paleo Valley had large deposits of stream deposits in that area. White quartz cobbles and pebbles were laid down in that ancient valley. The 
In the Forest Hill area, we find evidence of those ancient stream beds. There's a white quartz bedrock in there of rounded cobbles that's 800 feet wide and 200 feet deep in the bottom of that particular canyon. Huge things in that particular area. What kind of climate was it like? Mixed in with those white quartz cobbles are 10 to 12 foot diameter boulders of pure white quartz that are polished on all sides. Not a crack or fracture in it, smooth, just like in a rock tumbler. What kind of velocity of stream water came down through these Paleo Canyons that came down into California, out into the Great Valley in that particular area? Glacial, pardon? When was the Paleo Valley here? The Paleo Valley was here about 35 million years ago in that particular race. So what happened was, as these magma chambers and these gigantic supervolcanoes started erupting over there, when you have a massive eruption of this volcano, the thing shoots up into the air and produces a vertical column. And you all saw those pictures of St. Helens, 1980. This vertical column of ash and stuff went up to 35, 40,000 feet. The force of the volcano determines how high that column is going to be. The mass of material in it and the weight, it only can hold itself so long and the thing collapses. When it collapses, it falls down and pours out all the way around the edge of the volcano. These volcanic surges we call ash flow, tough ash flow tufts and stuff. And there's a term they use, they call it an ignimbrite. It's a hot incandescent gas that rolls down the edge of the volcano rolls down to the edge of the volcano to the extent of about 200 miles an hour and can be up to two to 400 feet thick pouring down these canyons. We now know evidence of this by opening up the top of these old, what we call tertiary streams and looking at these ignimbrite deposits that we see in these particular areas. So that canyon was completely filled with this ash flow tuff that went all the way down clear into the Sacramento Valley. We're now finding that the major stream canyons from Redding all the way down to Mariposa, all of these major stream canyons had these ash flow tufts that come out in there. I was working about a month and a half ago down south of Folsom, south of, of Highway 50 and, and White Rock Road, and I, I teach a mining history of the mother load class, and I was working on the history of the dredging fields down that area. So I'm looking at what the old dredgers left down in that, and here's a big white lobe sticking up about 25 or 30 feet of white quartz cobbles and clay and everything. It was what we call a rhyolite ignimbrite. That came from Virginia City, all the way down to Folsom in those particular areas. So, you know, there's just tremendous evidence that these things came down. We have had repeated episodes of these volcanic eruptions coming down these canyons. The first one filled it up with white quartz cobbles. Then the second one eroded, or we had this volcanic flow down there that filled the canyon right up to the top. And then a period of about eight or 10 million years, streams cut down through that volcanic, exposing the old gravels, and a new period of volcanoes occurred in this particular area. We can go south of Carson Pass. You can go just north up in here to the Barker Pass and the canyon up in that area there. And we find evidence of about three or four major periods of volcanic eruptions in the last 20 million years. About five, seven million years in between each of these major volcanic flows. So what's the chance of that volcanic activity happening again? Lassen's active. Mono Lake is, I mean, Mammoth is active. The new studies in Tahoe indicate that these volcanic flows came down these Paleo Canyons, and about three million years ago, we had some what we call extension forces. If you have a block of rock, and you can break that rock apart either by pulling it apart by tension or pushing it together by compression. Tensional forces up in here because of fault movements pushed or pulled these rocks apart and we had a series of faults occur and the Tahoe Basin occurred as a result of that. If you look right here to the east, you'll see that big steep, you're gonna be driving up that slope when you go out Cadillac Hill in that area there. You'll go along and you'll see a very steep scarp and then another steep scarp. 
those are faults where the Tau Basin moved that way and these blocks dropped down. This valley here is a fault dropped, fault formed valley. So there are faults on both sides of this. There's magmatic activity or magma chambers at depth beneath Lake Tahoe. The University of Nevada is doing some studies on micro seismic earthquakes and there's probably 60 to 70 earthquakes a month occurring under the north part of Lake Tahoe from magma activity from a magma chamber at about four miles deep down there. They're small earthquakes, you don't feel them very often, but once in a while you'll hear, hey, there was a six point magnitude in Truckee, areas like that. If you go to Tahoe City, there's a park right in Tahoe City. If you come along through that park, we've made measurements with gas collecting. Part of the gases in this magma chamber are carbon dioxide gas, that's part of these volcanic gases. Carbon dioxide gas tends to seep up through the fractures on these active faults. In that park in Tahoe City, you can take a gas measuring instrument right across the grass there, and the CO2 levels just go up high, and they go down like that. So that means that there is a fault, and it's potentially active. University of Nevada in Reno says you can have a magnitude 7.5 earthquake anytime from Reno to Bishop on the east side and we are part of the east side so this is volcanic or this is earthquake country you know if <laughs> and the faults and things like that if you're worried about that you know don't sleep in your tent tonight sleep in your jeep and fasten a seat belt so when the earthquake comes along in here and your jeep bounces around you won't fall out of the jeep in that particular area as you come down this west side of lake tahoe we have evidence that when this fault dropped down and the Tahoe Basin formed, there was a massive landslide of the west side into Lake Tahoe forming McKinney Bay. And you're going out with the Jeep trip right down into McKinney Bay. This massive landslide fell into the lake and created a giant wave that washed across the lake and then back and forth like water in a bathtub. This created what we call a seash it's like an inland tsunami caused by this massive landslide. As that material dumped down into the lake, it generated this massive wave and went across the lake and then it came back this side of the lake. When you go down and take Highway 89 and you come through Emerald Bay to South Lake Tahoe in that area there, you look at Emerald Bay and there's glacial moraine activity down in there the glacial moraines in the, in the Emerald Bay area there were moved and offset by this tsunami. The tsunami that swept there, they've measured the effects of that, was at least 80 feet tall, a wave 80 feet tall. So if you're going to spend the night at Tahoe at the lake and you're going to Harrah's in that particular case or Harvey's or whatever's up there now and you take that glass elevator up to the top of the wheel to get that Mai Tai with the little umbrella in it and stuff like that. Think about the magnitude 7 earthquake and then think about the siege that's possible. If you're going to rent a room down there, get at least above the 8th floor. <laughs> so when the wave comes in, you'll be safe in that particular area there. So, you know, this is kind of the, the, the earthquake country as we talk about it in here. And the potential for volcanic activity, what's the chance of a volcano erupting? There's a good chance that Tahoe, or the north end of Lake Tahoe, will become a mountain just like Mount Etna and Vesuvius in Italy in that particular area. So this, this the geology in this part of the world is really active as we're talking about this. I'm kind of skipping through and hitting what I call the highlights. Any questions? Now, I see that uh, I'm up to the point of, of uh, we're waiting for the helicopter to come back in or after teaching college classes for all these years, the attention span of my class participants is directly related to the amount of discomfort in their gluteus maximus. And after about 25 minutes of sitting on a hard rock, no matter what I say, you're not going to pay attention to me. You're shifting around trying to get circulation going again. So let's just kind of ease into Do I hear, hear the helicopter coming? Let's take five minutes, stretch 
get the blood circulating again and let's come back and talk about the gold and the mining history and the things that have happened up in this particular part of the country. So please stretch and do jumping jacks or you know, let's, let's ask questions and, and we'll talk about a variety of different things. There's always interested in the gold and the mother load and the mother load is a zone that's 120 miles long. The main plumbing system for the gold mines in that area is the Maloney's Fault Zone. The mother load gold came up as a hot water fallucin with quartz in that fault zone about 150 million years ago. So that's the estimated age of the mineralization in that area. How much gold is still left? Wow. I teach a mining history of the mother load class at Folsom Lake College. <laughs> at the end of the class, one of the I have a give a take home final. One of the questions I ask in the take home final is, how much gold is still left in the mother load? And I put down, lots is not the answer I'm looking for, <laughs> that type of thing. Give you an example. The stretch from Plymouth on Highway 49 to Jackson, that 11 mile stretch from, a from Plymouth to Jackson produced eight million ounces of gold. Just that 11 mile stretch of that 120. Eight million ounces of gold. Those mines, the Plymouth Consolidated in, in Plymouth, went down 4,400 feet. In Jackson, the, Kennedy, the Argonaut and the Kennedy went down 6,000 vertical feet. In between those, the mines are not quite that deep, but they were very, very productive. How much gold is still there? The average grade of the gold ore in that 11 mile stretch is about a quarter ounce of gold per ton of ore mined. A quarter ounce per ton. That means a, a ton of that ore is a, a very large wheelbarrow. That's a ton or, or a small half ton pickup bed in that particular area. So a quarter ounce of gold came out of that. To produce eight million ounces of gold that meant that they had to drill, shoot, blast, muck, shovel, and hoist 32 million tons of rock. 32 million tons of rock. It's on top of the ground. It's not down, you know, so I tell people, why go down and start a new mine and sink a new shaft? Those guys did it in 1870. It's sitting on top of the ground. Their milling efficiency was not that good. There's still millions of dollars worth of gold in the waste rock sitting around in these old particular mines. So, you know, get your pan out and go pan in the streams. Go look at these old mine dumps and stuff like that. They're real productive. The new thing that's come out now is the sophistication of the metal detectors. Metal detectors are now looking at you can look 18 inches in the ground and you can tell whether it's a rusty nail or a chunk of gold. It uh, just in, a, in the mother load area in the foothills as an example, um, El Dorado Hills, Highway 50, south of El Dorado Hills is La Trobe Road. There's a fault zone, the Bear Mountains fault zone that runs on the hillside halfway up. And I told people in class one time, I said, you know, those grassy hillsides south or downslope from that fault zone would be a really neat place to go prospect with a metal detector. So about 10 miles down La Trobe Road, one of the guys in class worked in the business park down there, and instead of taking a lunch, he wandered out knee deep in the grass with a metal detector and ran out through those old metals down there. 18 inches deep, he started getting hits. At the end of the semester, he came in and he said, you know, that was some neat advice. I want to show you what I did. He opened his briefcase and he pulled a mason jar out with 10 pounds of gold in it. Nuggets the size of walnuts. 10 pounds of gold that he got walking through a grassy meadow. Less than two feet deep in that particular area. So, you know, it doesn't have to be in a big white quartz vein sitting on the surface of the ground. It can be right in those particular areas. So how much is still left? Wow. Between Plymouth and Jackson, they have only touched 5% of that 11 miles. 95% of it is still there. So if the 11 miles produced 8 million ounces, 
how much is still left. The mother load is 120 miles long. So, you know, does that get you a little bit excited about going out and looking for gold? Boy, it sure should. You know, that's a, that's a neat hobby in that particular case. So, get you a quarter. The miners came up here in 49 in, in, in Placerville in Coloma. They discovered that yellow stuff in the tail racing Coloma. They worked their way up the south fork of the American River and they got up as far as, as the Chili Bar area, which is about 11 miles upstream, and they traced gold up that little canyon up into the little basin in Placerville. Hangtown Creek, right through that little basin in there, it wasn't called Hangtown Creek until they had some problems with the law, lawmakers in that area there. But that little basin was so rich in gold, the town of Placerville was built right on top of that little basin. The mining claims were so rich they were 25 feet on a side. When you staked a claim, all you got was 25 by 25, and you then tunneled down into the gravels in those particular areas. Huge, rich amount of gold in those areas. In fact, they built the town so big, so quickly, that they built the town right over the top of the stream beds in that area. About 15 years later, after they'd worked out most of the things, they came back and a group of a Chinese conglomerate went in and they made a deal with the property owners that owned the buildings in town in Placerville and they said, we will pay you to raise your building up 15 feet, we'll take all the gravel underneath it, put new dirt in and set your building back down. And so they took all the Main Street of Placerville and went underneath and mined all of the gravels underneath all the buildings in town in that particular area. It's still there. There's still lots of gold around the area, around the particular area. There are still people that are that are that are getting gold from these old stream beds. The easy gold in the Placer gravels was mined in about the first four or five years. Then they found the source of it, the white quartz veins. And they started sinking shafts and driving tunnels and things like that. It's in hard rock. When you sink a shaft in hard rock, what does it take to dig a eight by eight hole straight down? 1855 to 1860, what kind of equipment did we have then? We had 18 inch bars, we had three pound sledgehammers, and we'd bang, turn, bang, turn, bang, turn, and we get a hole 18 inches deep, fill it full of black powder, and shoot it, and then take the loose rock. The Kennedy and Argonaut mine have vertical shafts in hard rock 6,000 feet deep. What kind of work did it take to put a hole in the ground 6,000 feet deep? Huge amounts in that particular area. Well, so it meant that the little miner was really kind of out of business as the big conglomerates came in and took over. So the mining activity in Motherload really kind of dwindled into the late 1850s, and the prospectors and miners left the main Motherload and started coming up here in the high country. And they came up to the high country, they came up over Tahoe, and came up over the other side of the hill into the Virginia City area. People have been coming to the mother load in this particular area looking for the gold, coming over the crest of the Sierras looking for the gold down there. A Mormon group came in 18, about I think it was 1852, came through Carson City in the valley down in there and they stopped around the old town of Dayton and they were in their campsite getting ready to come over here and so they were panning and de detected a little bit of gold. Not enough to really get much interest. So they came back over to the mother load, came down around the Coloma area here, mined for, you know, five or six years. Then they went back and said, hey, let's go back and look at that area. So they started panning from the Dayton area and going up that stream. And they came up that stream bed up into what is now Virginia City. And they traced that and panned that and they got up to Virginia City in 1860. And they would dig a hole down three or four feet and they would pan it out and they hit a vein and there was so much gold in the vein that it was just just covered it but also there it was covered with this black mud this black stuff and so they had trouble they'd 
kept throwing that black stuff away and you know panning for the gold in those particular areas. They then started staking and the Comstock Lode was discovered in that particular area. The Comstock Lode, the black stuff was a silver sulfide called argentite. The chemical formula for argentite is AG2S. I've got a 10 pound piece of argentite that came from the Ophir mine up in there. Seven pounds of silver. Seven pounds of silver in a 10 pound rock. What's the price of silver today? You people ought to start looking at the metal market. <laughs> that particular case. <laughs> no. Okay. Silver, seven pounds of silver, there's 12 ounces per pound in precious metals, not 16, 12 ounces. And silver is 35, 40, 45 dollars in that particular case. So, you know, this because it's black and it doesn't shine like gold, doesn't mean it's not worth a heck of a lot of money. They're opening up a silver mine in Virginia City and Silver City down in there. Their first pour is going to be in October and they estimate to pour probably 10 tons of silver a month. Tons in that particular case. So, you know, there's lots of metal things going on. To get, go back to the 1860s when people were coming up in there, coming up into this country. How do you travel in the 1860s through this part of the world? The main road to Washoe or Virginia City the main way of getting over the crest of the Sierras was to come out of Sacramento, take a stage to Placerville, and then to Placerville, they had a road along the river, and it was called the Placerville Toll Road. And that was the main road that one came up the South Fork of the American River, up over the crest of Echo Summit, around the lake, and then went down into Virginia City. This is the first road to cross the Sierras, financed by the state legislature. The state legislature financed it and ran out of money in 1860, or 1852. They ran out of money, had enough money to build it to Placerville and didn't, couldn't build it any further. So what they did was they offered, if you were a contractor and you wanted to build 10 miles of road, we'll let you build it and then you can charge toll for the people that use that road. So from Placerville to Virginia City, the road was constructed, the Placerville Toll Road. There were 58 toll stations along that road. Unbelievable. If you look at back, the money generated from that, if you look back at the, the county records in, in the county seat in Placerville, the cut to the Board of Supervisors, they got their percentage of the toll on the Placerville Toll Road in 1860 was about $600,000. That was their cut of the tolls, people going to Virginia City. So they said that that road was open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, winter and summer. In the winter time, they had sleds that would beat the snow down so that the wagons could come through. The dust was so thick in the summer, every mile and a half they had big water trucks to water the dust down and that type of thing. If your wagon broke down and you pulled it off, you had to wait a day and a half to get back in line in that particular area. So, and these guys, you know, this is serious thing. There were prospectors all over this part of the world, and they were combing the woods on their way up here looking for gold and silver on their way to Virginia City. In the winter time, come up here in the winter, you know, we're sitting on a rock and sun shining like this. What is this country like in January? This rock is covered by 35 feet of snow. It's cold up in here. It is, in this particular area, if you're going on your way to Virginia City, you know, you've got all your gear and supply and tents and a little wagon and stuff going through these snow banks and things like that. You'd pitch a tent, you're carrying everything that you have with you. If you got dynamite, the dynamite is a mixture of sand and nitroglycerin and it freezes in the winter so if you want to blast, you got to put the dynamite on top of the stove and let it melt a little bit. Being careful knowing that you can't exceed a certain temperature in that particular case. So then when you're going through here, how cold is it? These guys sitting around in the winter time, it was so cold that when they whistled, it froze the notes in the air. So when you're hiking in the country in the spring, 
as the snow melts and these beautiful melodies come out of the trees and stuff like that, what you're listening to are the frozen whistles of the prospectors and miners that came through the area. That's enough for an introduction. I'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Mr. Wheeler? Yes. Are they going to let us dredge anymore, or is that done? The question about dredging, I was appointed to the state committee on suction dredging, and we sat through committee meetings for a year. And the end of the meeting was that there's a moratorium on suction dredging, and there are permits that are going along and stuff like that. It's now in the hands of fish and game. After 14 meetings, it's still in the hands of the fish and game. And the environmentalists and, and the people say there's such potential for mercury contamination that they're really going to cut down on the amount of dredging. It'll probably be another year and a half and then very limited to that area. They said that the, the mercury concentration from the Bear River and the Yuba River through the Malinikoff diggings in these areas coming down through that particular part and down into the Sacramento Valley was from the mining. Well, it's interesting because the U.S. Geological Survey has made a water chemistry report of the arsenic levels in the Sacramento River from Redding all the way down to Sacramento. Natural occurring arsenic in the Sacramento River above the mining communities is higher in natural waters than it is from the mining area there. So the science doesn't back up the decisions that are being made in that area. Where's the, if you take a look at it, the northeast corner of the state has all these extrusive volcanic rocks, huge amounts of arsenic in these volcanoes. You go up to Lassen and bump as hell, the water in the springs there has a hundred times the arsenic concentration than any other area bubbling up normally. They're saying that when you dredge in the stream, it's going to flower the mercury and then it's going to flow down and get into the stream in that particular area. So it's, it's, it's tied up in a controversial shouting match between the people that are anti-mining and anti-mercury. What's your personal belief? My personal belief is that, you know, it, it's, it's not going to, if it's higher above there than it is below there, it's not going to be a problem. It's like arsenic. There's natural occurring arsenic in the mother load. It occurs with the gold. And so the EPA came into to Sutter Creek a few years ago and they said, you mine the gold you ore, you crush the rock, and the mill tailings from the crushing of that have all this arsenic in it. So this is a real problem. There was a subdivision built in Sutter Creek called Mesa de Oro. In that subdivision, they came in, they sampled the soil in the subdivision, and they said, you've got arsenic concentrations of up to 35 or 40 parts per million. And so the EPA came in and the state and everything, and they said, you've got to clean up that soil and get it down below 20 parts per million. And so they dug up the dirt around the whole subdivision and exported it around four feet deeper on every house there and exported it out and put it in a farmer's yard two miles down the road. And the reason they did that, they said, well, you've got a nice big field. If you don't let us put it here, I'm being a little facetious, we'll make you dig up your yard. It's still sitting in his yard down there. Well, what happens is they made us clean up the arsenic level in that, around that mine. Natural occurring arsenic 50 feet away from that subdivision in ground that's never been touched the arsenic levels is up to a thousand parts per million. So, you know, we spent $22 million in Mesa de Oro. They just for extended the dredging moratorium to 2015. 2016, 2015. yeah. So we're, you know, it, there, there's a lot of controversy about that type of thing. With this heavy metal with arsenic, they said everybody's going to die. Well, 120 miles of houses and people living in the mud load for 140 years, the cemetery should be lined with people that have died from arsenic poisoning. And it's not happening. They came in after this major cleanup 
and they sampled the fingernails and the hair and, and the urine of the residents that lived in the subdivision. And if you touch it, breathe it, you excrete it. Zero arsenic, nothing in there. And the EPA's comment on that was, boy, we did a good job cleaning it up, didn't we? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting, uh, getting into my pol political animal there at that particular point. It, the dredging will come around. Uh, you can probably still do some high banking. It, you know, you've got to do it carefully, that type of thing. It's too bad because there's so many things that can be done with dredging that are not going to harm the environment in that particular case. Question? Oh gosh, the first people came into this valley was probably 1850. No, oh, well, before that. This is the Martis complex natives that came in here, and they go back about three, four thousand years. You can still find evidence of their habitation in here, right around the camp, even where you're walking up to to, to uh, get your meals and stuff. Take a look around. There's some arrowheads and and uh, artifacts and chips and flakes and stuff left from that particular complex. They migrated over in the summertime from the Carson Carson Valley area here and would summer over here and hunt and fish and everything. Then they go back down below in, in the wintertime. Their main source of food in the winter was the pinion pine, pine nuts in that particular area. So, but they were, they lived up and down this area very commonly. North of here, in Martis Valley, there are all kinds of petroglyphs and pictographs and stuff on the rock. So, a lot of, a lot of old time, you know, Native American evidence around here. God, I put everybody to sleep <laughs> in that particular case. Yeah, people want to take hikes, hike up into these hills here, and you'll see them the Yes, there's hikes, you can go around these rocks. Let me caution you. We're up here six, 7,000 feet. There are rattlesnakes up here. There are snakes in this country. A couple of years ago, I killed one right against the edge of my tent. I'm sitting there and with my elbow running, something was moving on, and I went outside and here's a four foot rattlesnake right against my tent, 200 feet down there. So they're here, you know, make lots of noise. <laughs> That's no excuse for three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you gotta be, you know, to fight them, you gotta be sober. Would I talk about serpentine? Okay. When you have an ocean plate subducting into a, against a continental plate down in there, the upper part of the crust, or lower part of the crust and upper part of the mantle, is a rock we call peridotite. It's a rock that contains a lot of ferromagnesium, a lot of dark minerals in that area. It has a lot of iron and magnesium in it. What happens when this subduction zone goes down, there's usually a big submarine trench off the coast. So when the sub subducting plate goes down, it takes some of the mud and some of the sediments and some of the water down with it. As it carries those down to depth, what happens is you end up with a zone of very high pressure but low temperature because of the water that's brought down with it in that particular area. If you take a peridotite at about 300 degrees, heat it up under really high pressure, that's where the rock serpentine is made. So serpentine is only formed in a fault subduction zone in a zone of high pressure, low temperature. Now is that naturally occurring asbestos? No. The rock, green rock serpentine has a variety of different, three common minerals in it. There's a dark green one called antigorite. There's a yellowish slick coating called lizardite. You'll see that on the cutting. And then it has little tiny fine white veins of chrysotile, and that's asbestos. So there's a big controversy about the asbestos in turpentine. If you put it on a road rock, and you drive over it, one rock abrades against the other, and it generates dust, and the dust could contain asbestos. The chrysotile asbestos in serpentine in the foothills, if you breathe that in, 
it generates magnesium hydroxide and dissolves. The bad asbestos called tremolite is insoluble and that's what causes problems. But of the asbestos that we find in the mother load here, 99.99% .99 of it is all chrysotile and very, very little of it is the tremolite. So there's another... The green, the green colored serpentine? In the green Four colored... Fill. Yeah, in the green colored, same thing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's not that, not that much of a problem. You know, they spent four or five million dollars in Eldorado Hills and completely remediated all the soil around Oak Ridge High School because of the serpentine. Studied it for three years and the Department of Toxic Substance Control out of Atlanta came back in after three years and said, you know, we've really sampled this thing and it really doesn't seem to be that much of a problem. The school district spent three million dollars. You know, they went around the neighborhoods in white Tyvek respirators riding little kids' bicycles around there to come up with a conclusion that it's not a problem, not going to kill people. Okay, it's 11 o'clock. Probably going to start the line for lunch. I don't know what it is in that particular area. But, uh, you know, I'm going to be in camp. So please, if you got questions, pick up rocks and stuff. I'll give another talk tomorrow morning. Thank you. Happy birthday.